guys, so Cal Val here and you are watching Lucifer on YouTube. Hello you beautiful creatures, how the devil are you? I hope you're well. If you're new here, my name is Lou, or Lucifer, as my friends like to call me. By my friends, I mean my ever-growing army of demons. Yes, yes, I know, my shades are coffin-shaped. Uh, I've just come back from a work do, yes, and it was wonderful. This is going to be a little bit different, so situation um we got tickets for yorkshire comic con however because of work commitments i can no longer go which is fair so gareth is very kindly this one hello is very kindly going to take you along to yorkshire comic con this is the first yorkshire comic con done by monopoly events so it's going to be very interesting to see what the venue is like how they work it you're only going to see john cleese aren't you yes which I'm very upset about because I really wanted to go and see him. But it's fine. We move. Um, so, yes, he's going to show you around. He's going to show you the stalls. He's going to show you what's going on, how the day's going to work. And then we're going to discuss it at the end of the video. So I'm completely like, when I edit this, I'm going in completely blind. Like, I'm going to have no idea what I'm editing, which is going to be very exciting, actually. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. What are you most looking forward to, dear, before you go to bed? John Cleese. Yes. <laughs> what are you most apprehensive about? Because the last mm. time we went to a Monopoly event was London, no, yeah, Liverpool. Liverpool Comic Con, and it didn't end so well. It'll be, oh, I'll come in here, I've had a haircut. Looks very handsome, <laughs> don't you? I try. My beautiful boy. Oh. Uh, the organisation, with it being a brand new event, mm -hmm. that'll be interesting. Okay. So, we shall see. From the photos, I mean, you thought it looked quite small. I think it looks little. But we shall see when I get there. Now, you guys need to be my eyes and ears, so he buys no treats for me, okay? I mean, she's going to be editing it anyway, so... <laughs> but yes, I hope you have a horrible time in the best possible way. I will see you later, but now, on to Gareth. It feels weird being at one of these events without Lou, but uh, but yeah, I'm here at Yorkshire Comic, well Comic Con Yorkshire, which is the, one of the newest uh, conventions in Monopoly events arsenal. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a lovely drive up here, about two, uh, just over two hours, that's including a stop off. And there's actually not that many people here, and we've got about 50 minutes until the event opens. They could open early, you never know. Um, so the plan for today is that I'm going to, oh, what's going on there? Uh, first things first, I'm going to go meet John Cleese. Uh, he's the only meet and greet that I've got for today. And then we're going to do a little tour of the site just to show everyone what it's about. First thought, it's a lovely area, absolutely stunning. And also it's free parking on site. So if you want to come next year, it's free parking. So you can't uh, say no to that. But I'm going to get out of the car and jump in the queue because there's not that many people there. And I shall see you inside. So, just as I predicted, we're in early. So just having a little walk through the stall. So I'm going to do a bit of a venue tour in a bit, after I've met John Cleese, just heading down to where all the guests are. 
but as soon as that's done then he's just waiting around until John does his talk so the way they're working it for this con is that you enter through hall number two and then you have to walk all the way through into hall number one and that's where all your guests are you can see they've set up ready for James Masters, Danny Glover just looking for John Cleese there's, there's the table right now to wait so I'll see you all in a bit Okay, so I'm trying to come off cloud nine at the moment, so yeah, I just met John Cleese, uh, so and I, to I told him this as well, that it's a core memory of mine that growing up, like um, I used to watch Monty Python with my granddad, who's sadly, sadly not with us, and I, t I, told him, I told him that and he was just lit up, absolutely lit up, and he's a, a true gentleman. Absolute true gentleman, Lou. I am so sad that you're not here, but yeah, <laughs> I had to. Just she, she wouldn't forgive me otherwise. But yeah, uh, so that's my autograph done. I'm now wandering around, getting my bearings, just walking to the cafe. I'm gonna have a little look at the merch and then I will do a full venue tour but yeah was queuing for John had a lovely chats with Neil uh, Neil from Monopoly events who's he's almost like the face of the love of horror he's always there on the lives so gave us some really cool tidbits and stuff I can't say I'm not going to but it's very exciting what uh, they've got planned for the love of horror but yeah gonna have a look around the trade stall now and then I will be back with you for a full venue tour. So, on my little tour, I have found our very good friend... What up? Dean of the Dead. Or, or as we start calling you, Dean of the Dean Sauce. Of the sauce. <laughs> Someone else calls me Dean of the Ribs. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why, because I don't do anything to do with ribs. But hey, <laughs> Dean of the Sauce, Dean of the Dead, whatever. I've been no. called worse. <laughs> now, because I, I've met John Cleese and Lou sort of hasn't, as punishment, well, let's say punishment, I have got to try one of Dean's sauces. However, Dean has come up with a lovely idea to wait for Manchester. Now, Dean, explain what I'm going to be in for. So, um, I thought for reaction purposes, it would be good to, for you to try uh, one that we call Monster Mash. Uh, that's the hottest one we do. So it's, bur it's bourbon, it's lime, it's Carolina Reaper Mash. It's a bit of nine mil extract. Um, so, I think purely for reaction purposes for the camera, <laughs> that's the one you need to try. However, we sold out, we don't have any with us, so it's a very lucky escape for Gareth this time. Yeah. <laughs> but tune back in on the Manchester vlog and you will be able to see this man perspiring someone. <laughs> and also, Lou will be there to witness it, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, things I do for love. <laughs> Cheers, Dean. No worries, man, no worries. <laughs> Alrighty then, so I have just got my bearings, so now I'm going to give you. The full venue tour. So, as you, en you enter through this side here, and you walk into this one, which is known as Hall Two, and this is where you mainly half of the vendors. Uh, so I've, I've had a walk around. So you've got all your your art, your Funko Pops, Dean. Can't forget Dean. Quite a few vendors that we've seen before on the channel. Also in this side, in this side of the hall, we've got toilets either side. But yeah, this is a really big venue. Nice and spread out as well, compared to if you saw the, some of the other vlogs that we've done at Wales, or London, Liverpool. These are incredibly spaced out. Also, I don't think there's actually many people here today, which um, I think for a first convention is actually quite surprising. But yeah, this is the main, this is the uh, first vendor hall. The toilets in each corner. Then moving on, I'm going to keep going through here. Got Pigeon Creek Studios as well. These are always an absolute delight. Then to get to Hall 1, we'll come down this side and we have to cross to the cafe. Which I probably will come in here for a little bit of lunch, just a little snack. 
but a nice spacious cafe selection of hot foods and also the verandas open as well and as we walk through into hall one we've got a couple of dinosaurs <laughs> You've got to love your inflatable dinosaurs at conventions. <laughs> You've got to love it. You've got to love it. Right, so now, this is hall one. And we've got some more, like your bigger stalls, bigger clothing, your pokeballs over there. More artwork. You've got your your weapons, they're here as well. Project Donut. I will be back. <laughs> <laughs> then in the centre, we've got the gaming zone. So you've got all your classic games, you've got PlayStations, Sega. Set pieces and prop builds. Running down this side. And then as we move more into the into the venue. This is where they'll be holding their talks. Oh, friend of the channel Mike is sat down there that's taking over the cosplay masquerade. So Calval is gonna be doing the talks sat there over there. We're going to be come down, coming down here for John Cleese's talk. Then, official Monopoly events merchandise. A couple of more props and set pieces. And we've got just the one photo studio here in the middle. Because there's not that many guests at this event. So they only just need the one uh, photo studio. And then as we reach the far side, this is where you've got all your guests. So looking, so just looking around, we have got cast members from Game of Thrones. We've got Georgie Farmer from Wednesday, who played Ajax. We've got Gabriel Luna, who was Ghost Rider in Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Zach Galligan, everyone knows from Gremlins. The legend that is John Cleese. So nice, so nice to meet you. Sorry Lou, sorry. <laughs> We've got three cast members from Hello Hello, which is a, a classic British sitcom set in the Second World War. Danny Glover, who is famously in Die Hard. And then we've got James Masters and Chris McCarpenter who were in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And that is pretty much it. So, quite a small convention. I'd say the venue is brilliant. I think it also helps that there aren't that many people here. So, you could easily walk around and just take it all in, enjoy yourself. So. Yeah, I, I've got no complaints, I've, even though I've, I've only come for the one guest. This has been a really good day yeah. so far. I'm now yeah. practically finished. <laughs> I've got to wait until court three for John Cleese's talk. What was the ice cream? And then through here, so they've got a few more set pieces. I did see on the map there is also a quiet room as well, so if things get a bit bit much, you can retreat. Oh, we've got another cafe. So if you, find, if you think that the first cafe is a bit much, uh, you can always come to this one, this one's dead, there's no one here. And then this is where you exit the venue. All in all, I'm really impressed. Compared to Liverpool, I prefer this one. If they had any more guests, I think it would be a bit much, personally. But no, I'm I'm really I'm really happy with this. It's going to be a good day. It's going to be a very good day. Just been on my rounds. We have to do a little shout out for Shadow Goulet, representing our favourite band, Ghost. As you can tell, you've got the tattoo and the hat. <laughs> but yeah, we'll hopefully see you at a gig soon. Where are you? 
are you, Lou? I'm your number one fan. Does he not, ladies and gentlemen? My goodness. Yeah. In the presence of greatness here in Harrogate. Yes, you don't have to do that anymore. We'll take it for red. <laughs> well, out of your entire illustrious career, which I could name so many amazing roles you've done, what are you most proud of? What are you particularly proud of? I, was, I thought my performance in Ben-Hur was particularly fine. Um, it took me a long time to learn that chariot riding. Yeah. Um, but I thought I did it, and I also got laughs I wasn't expecting, so I was very happy with that. Well, as an American, I hope you guys will indulge me. Um, I have to say, even though I've seen you in so many amazing things, I did love you in Will and Grace. Oh, Will and Grace was yes. a wonderful experience, yes. That's absolutely right. My daughter got me that job because she used to uh, ride a whole lot with uh, James Barrow's daughter, and they were chatting um, at a, a horse uh, event. And she said, why don't you give your, my dad a job? He needs the money. <laughs> and the next thing was, Jimmy Burrows, who's the best director I've ever worked with, asked me to do six shows for Will and Grace. How many of you know that Will and Grace? Yay! Yeah. And it was a terrific experience because <laughs> they created my part because Deborah, what's her name? Messing. Mm -hmm. Messing. Deborah Messing was pregnant and they didn't want her to appear to be pregnant in, because she wasn't pregnant in the show, if you see what I mean. So she was doing all her scenes standing behind things. And uh, so they had to create some extra material. So they got me in a relationship with Megan Mullally, who's one of the best people I've ever worked with. 
And I just simply love those shows. Bumped into the head of Light Entertainment, who was in charge of us, and he said to our director, what is this Monty Python thing? Is it supposed to be funny? I think it's awful. <laughs> now, this is the guy who was the head of the department. <laughs> I think that's funny, even if you don't. <laughs> and then, uh, when we, when the first series had gone out, they discussed it. The heads of all the different departments of the BBC discussed it, and six out of eight thought it should be cancelled. Six out of eight of them said, it's no good, we shouldn't make it anymore. And then when the Americans bought the rights, I met, uh, I met some people who came up to me at the weekend and they said, oh, we just bought the American rights for 40,000. I said, woo, you know, ching, 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 ching. And uh, I said, have you changed anything? I mean, do Americans have problems with small family hotels when they used to change? And they said, no, no, we, we've changed very little. We've only changed one thing. And I said, what was that? They said, we've written Basil out. Can you believe that? They bought 40 tire scripts and then they got rid of the Basil character. So these are the sort of people in charge all over the world most of the time. But you do need one or two people. In the BBC in the old days, you see the guys who were actually producing comedy had started as floor managers and had been floor managers directing the traffic for Michael, uh, for, for um, Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Corbett. And if you do that for five years, working with people like Barker and Corbett, you begin to find out what it's all about. But these commissioning editors have absolutely no idea, and putting them in charge of making it a democracy, I think has really done the British public uh, a great disservice, because we used to be able to watch a whole lot of very good comedy all the time. And a young comic said to me that there's a saying going around, the BBC means bye-bye comedy. And uh, I said to him, I'm bored. And he said, well, so am I. And I said, why don't we write a near, really... <laughs> Is that it? Oh, uh, why don't we write a really naughty sketch that will upset everyone? Right. <laughs> I thought we were going quite well then. <laughs> Shall I continue, or would you like me to wait a bit? Because they may get bored eventually, even if I don't. Well. <laughs> All right, where was it? The, the, oh yes, that's right. So we decided, he said, we should do something about dead bodies. And I said, good idea. So we wrote, a, um, an undertaker sketch and I went into the uh, into the um, undertaker's shop and uh, he said can I help you and I said well I'm afraid my mother's died and uh, I don't know and they said well he said there's three things we can do we can uh, dump her we can burn her or we can um, we can burn her, we can dump her, or what was the other one? We can burn her, we can dump her, what was the other one? Oh, well, that's right, or we can stick her in the ground. <laughs> and I said, well, what are the advantages? He said, well, you know, burning is quick. It's not, it's not good if they're still alive, but it's still quick. <laughs> uh, and he said, and then dumping her, we just put her in the Thames, it costs nothing at all. Um, or we can bury her, and then again, uh, that's not great if she's still alive. Uh, you know, so I said, well, what do you recommend? Uh, and he says, well, she's quite young, isn't she? And I said, yes, she was. Mum was quite young. And he shouts off. He says, Fred, I think we've got an eater. And I said, well, you, oh, what? He, he said, nothing. Yes, I said, are you, uh, I said, are you suggesting eating my mother? And he said, well, 
not raw, you know. <laughs> Cooked, he said, it was parsnips, roast potatoes. <laughs> I said, well, I'm a bit picky. No, I said, we can't eat my mummy. <laughs> It's the naughtiest sketch we ever did. And the guy who was in charge, Michael Mills, who was great, Michael said, you can do it because it's so funny, but only if the audience invades the set in, pro in protest at the end. So that's what we did. And I still do the sketch sometimes, and it is absolutely outrageous. And people get out of control because you see, if you get into these slightly edgy areas where people are a little bit anxious, you know, what I call taboo areas, if you start making uh, jokes in the areas to do with taboos, like sex is still a taboo, you know, violence is a taboo, and I think of Fish Called Wanda, you've got somebody uh, there, Michael Palin's trying to kill the old woman, and he keeps killing her dogs. <laughs> and the audience screams with laughter. Now how can they be laughing at, at somebody who's killing dogs? And the main reason is that the dogs are Yorkshire Terriers. Everybody knows they're not proper dogs, you see, but we get, if they'd been, if they'd been German Shepherds, I would not be here to tell the tale, you know, but, it's extraordinary, it's like the Black Knight sketch in Holy Grail. People, I've watched that 30 times with an audience, it gets more laughter than anything else, than any other scene, and it's a man cutting another man's arms and legs off. <laughs> you see, now some people can see that it's funny because it's the idea is funny, whereas the reality would be appalling. And the problem with literal-minded people is they can't see it as an idea. They can only see it literally for what it is. And this is the great problem with uh, literal-minded people is that they don't have the same sort of minds that we do. And this means that they really cannot enjoy the sort of humor that most of us enjoy. I just find it interesting and hilarious that we're talking about Yorkshire Terriers as a taboo subject in Yorkshire. That's perfect, right? Well, I noticed it didn't get much of a laugh, so I will say, <laughs> I will say Lancashire Terriers. Perfect. Actually, that's what we were killing in 1973. And what happened was, earlier on, a guy had come from the public uh, broadcasting station in Boston, which was uh, called... Um, uh, GBH, GBH Boston, which is police call grievous bodily harm, this is what I'm always able to remember. But GBH came and they sent a guy and he met us and sat down to watch a couple of episodes with us. And uh, he watched it and when the lights went up, he was white as a sheet because he was realizing what would happen to his career if he had anything to do with Monty Python, because we were so bizarre in those days compared with anything on American television. And he sort of mumbled a, a, um, a, a sort of greeting or a, a farewell and disappeared into the distance. We never heard from any of them again. And then what happened in 1974 is quite interesting. And I only got this story three years ago from the guy who could tell it. Um, and he was, he was running the, uh, the Dallas PBS station. And he said that when he was shown Monty Python, he had heard that it had been turned down in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, everywhere. Everywhere with a big PBS station had turned it down. And this guy, whose name was Ron de Villiers, in Dallas, he liked it. He said, I'm going to stick my neck out, and he put it out. And the response of the people in Dallas was terribly good. And all his friends from the other PBS station were saying, what happened? Did they burn the station down? Did you get stoned on the way to earth? No, he said, it's fine. And then they put it out everywhere. But if Ron de Villiers, who's up there now, Bless you, Ron. If he hadn't put us out, 
we would probably never have been heard of. Isn't that extraordinary? And it shows how much of life is pure luck, pure luck. Um, you're very are, you a, are you a pirate too? I'm not quite, no. Um, I lost my hat. <laughs> oh, all right, all right, so we'll have a non-piratical. Oh, now Apparently you've got I am. Hat on. She's got the hat on. We can have a slightly piratical question. So you're very prevalent on Twitter. Um, what's your favourite account to follow and which one do you love to hate to follow? I like my own. I think it's really top class. And I go to it straight thing in the morning to try and remember what I wrote the previous night. And sometimes I make good jokes, but also I think that this country is in an awful mess at the moment. And so I do tend to put out some more serious things because I think that we need to aim in a direction. I think the first thing we have to put right is we have to get a press that we can trust. The, the statistics, there's a company called, not a company, a group called the European Broadcasting Union. And every year they ask a thousand different people in all the European countries about trusted printed media, not TV, but printed media. And we are last almost every year. Occasionally we get above Malta, on one occasion, we were rated better than Macedonia, but most of the time we are rated worse. That's the British people saying whether they have trust in British newspapers. And until we get newspapers that are reasonably fair and trying to put out a balanced opinion, then I don't think anything in this country is going to happen. The other thing that I think has to happen in conjunction with that is the introduction of proportional representation so that we have several parties and coalition governments because coalition governments are a very good way to stop corruption and the corruption of the recent Tory governments has been, I believe, unbelievable. It has been something I would not have thought was credible or possible 30 years ago. The degree of corruption is just awful. I and mean, it is people going into politics who are not very talented as they used to be and are really just um, using their position to make as much money as possible. And I never thought British politics would be like that. So I I'm a bit more serious than usual, but I'm still able to make good jokes. I mean, when, when Piers Morgan says, when are you going to be funny again, please? It's been a long time. I can say, when are you going to be talented? It's been a lifetime. <laughs> now, what, once you've done that, once you've done that, they tend not to come after you so much. <laughs> Yes, and your question is? <laughs> yes. um, I was just going to ask, um, where did you get the inspiration for Manuel? Well, in the 60s, I'll tell you what happened, it was quite interesting. English food used not to be good. Uh, it were, really was very poor. And the reason that the food was so poor is we had an empire to run. And people didn't want to eat for pleasure because there wasn't time. There was an empire to run. So they ate for fuel. Do you see what I mean? My parents weren't interested in the taste of food. What they wanted to know was, was it hot? Do you see what I mean? So we treated food as fuel. Then we lost our empire, and we looked around and thought, well, we can eat better now. And fortunately, at that time, there were some Italian restaurants for the first time in the early 60s in London that were very wonderful. And then the restaurants realized that they didn't have to pay people proper wages if they could bring them in from abroad. And then we went through a period where all the pet waiters didn't speak very good English. And I used to say, um, I had about a 50% chance of getting the dish that I'd ordered. Do you see? Literally, 50% chance sometimes you got lucky. And so I noticed that most of the waiters at that point happened to come from Spain. So when I started to write 40 Tars, I thought if I make him Spanish, it will be not because it's rather a wonderful civilization with some extraordinary artistic achievements, but that one person from Spain is not stupid 
and he's always nice and good-natured and kind and desperate to do the right thing, but he doesn't speak very good English, and it's worse than Basil Spanish. <laughs> and I just think that miscommunication is very often very, very funny. What happens is that people then say, oh, so you're saying that all Spanish people are stupid, are you? You know, it's a bit like saying, let's ban Hamlet, because Hamlet is a, is a stereotype, you see? He's a, a, a suicidal uh, Scandinavian, so it's, a, so it's a, right, it's a stereotype. So we can't have that, we can't have Macbeth anymore because he's a violent Scots person. And we all know that Scots people are universally violent. Uh, so to take one character and then assume that you're referring to the entire nation is of course absurd. But I will tell you something funny, when Fortitas first went out in Barcelona, <laughs> of all cities, it suddenly disappeared from the Barcelona television screens for several weeks. And when Fortitas returned, Manuel was Portuguese. <laughs> and when the Americans did versions, he was an Iraqi in one, you know. But it don't, you, just because you portray one person, it doesn't mean that you're trying to pretend that the whole nation is exactly like that person. And that's the kind of extraordinarily stupid thinking that you only get from people who are literal minded, which is why there are such a threat to culture in every possible way. Well, we just want to say thank you so much for being here and for all of your amazing stories. And so wonderful to hear that you have so many exciting projects coming up. Any final words for the fans here in Harrogate that have come to see you? Yes, if you want to stay active in late life as I am, the thing to do is to get, in, uh, you get involved in a truly ruinous divorce. <laughs> That's good advice. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation. Yes, standing ovation for... The legend that is John Glees. <laughs> Amazing questions, everybody. Thank you so much. Keep the applause going. For well, that talk was a riot, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, God, that was such a fun talk. John Cleese comedy legend. Absolutely fantastic. I've just said my goodbyes to everyone. And huge shout out. Thank you very much, Val, for doing the intro for the video. Uh, I've, sent, I've sent it to Lou and she's over the moon with it. Speaking of which, we can't leave uh, a Monopoly Comic Con without Project Donut. But there, oop, there we go, that's the venue. We'll get, I'll give my final thoughts when I pick Lou up because I'm going to pick her up from work. But yeah, I've had a really good day. I know Lou's been feeling a bit, a bit sad, like fear of missing out. But, um, but yeah. I think what we've got sorted and everything we've got looking to look forward to will uh, will make up for it. But I'm now heading back to the car. I'm going to stop off at Meadow Hall on the way back, get some food, and then the next time you see, see me, I will be with the woman, the myth, the legend, Lucifer. So, see you in a bit. And we are back again. I am cripplingly depressed Did you guys uh, see Lou in the vlog? He was everywhere <laughs> I've had an awful day but I'm assuming that like you guys had the best day and Gareth has assured me that you have also had the best day um yeah yes so my thoughts go on then it's very good very good very nice oh dear. so venue is brilliant the only problem with the venue is that one of the halls you could not get signal for the life of you. Yeah, I tried messaging you like multiple times, being like, are you picking me up from work? Because I don't know. <laughs> and the messages just didn't go yeah. through. So one hall, I think it was because all the card machines were using the Wi-Fi and the signal. <clears throat> so that was that was my only complaint. It was a really nice venue. Everything was spaced out. The vendors, there was plenty of space to walk around. So a huge improvement from Liverpool. Uh, I think that also because not that many people went, punter-wise. So you're basically saying that this is another potentially good starter comic convention very, for uh, very good. beginners. That's really mm. cool because we've we've only really said that about York, uh, Yorkshire, uh, Horicon with how small it is. And mm. 
it is very busy um very very busy like like we said i'm pretty sure it's oversold um but for the scale of it the size it is mm. it's very doable for first time yeah. conventions um yeah. have you already shown your autograph yeah oh my god he's thought of it all that's mm. wild um and you haven't bought anything for me i have actually what i told you i got you a treat <clears throat> You're gonna, yeah. Yeah. What is it? The Black Rose series. So. Okay. So in the in the vlog, I did a little bit of b-roll around this person. Okay. Uh, an independent author. This these she has three volumes. Yeah. They're all like books inside. Yeah. So the premise of this one. Yeah. From what she was telling me, is a girl gets taken to hell to join Lucifer. She was like handpicked for by Lucifer, and Lilith, Lilith is in here, and she's not happy, but she's also a badass. Oh, and she's also signed it for you. you. Signed it. Well, I didn't. well, no, not you. you Laura, silly. Laura, lovely to talk to, and she's from Stafford. Yeah, near us, <laughs> near our neck of the woods. Oh, that's wonderful. It's very thoughtful. Mm. Thank you. I thought instead of getting some trinkets, I thought something like this, like a starter into a new set of volumes. It's something you're interested in. I'll read it after I've finished reading Lionel Dahmer's um, sto story. Autobiography. Retelling of Jeffrey Dahmer. Why have you got that? Mum gave it to me. Ah. Huh. Even though I don't condone it. I've got to read it. I've got to read it. This is lovely. Thank you. You're welcome. Hmm. I'm still cripplingly depressed. <laughs> but it's it's nice to hear that you've had such a good time. And because you weren't feeling great last night. So, you know, we, we strive to find places that are very... Safe spaces. Yeah, safe spaces and accommodating for, like, anxiety. Um, so it would be very ideal for me. Hmm. Um what was your favourite bit of the day? John Cleese's talk. <laughs> it was chaotic. I can imagine it would be amazing. <laughs> it was absolutely chaotic, but fun. What was your least favourite part of the day? Ooh. Uh, I think the lack, of, the lack of signal in one room was a, a bit of an inconvenience. It's a given though, isn't it? Um... I think it's. I think the the, neg the main negative is just mainly circumstantial. I was just waiting. Yeah, that's just circ fair. that's circumstantial. Because realistically, you only went to see John Cleese, didn't you? Like yeah. that's that's nobody's fault. Yeah. But uh, thank you as well to everybody who came to say hello to Gareth. Massive appreciation. Dean of the Source. Dean of the Source. Who's going to have me killed in Manchester? You're welcome. I've been literally looking at the wrong camera for ages. <laughs> oh my god. It's been a long day. It's been an awful day. For both of us. Um, not awful for But me, you've but... had a great day. <laughs> I've had an awful day. So it's fine. It's okay. But yes, I'm literally going to get mm. to editing Big the... Big shout out to Kerry and Mike, as I always. So, so Calval. For what a beautiful woman. Lending her services for the intro to this vlog. Yeah, if anybody ever wants to do like an intro for the vlog, like let us know because we love doing that kind of stuff. Like cosplayers especially. Uh, I will say for cosplayers, a lot of the time we do tend to gravitate towards the horror orientated cosplays mainly because that's that's or what if the channel is like or if they look incredible the bumblebee one you'll see when you edit that yeah, looked yeah. amazing uh, um i watched the cosplay masquerade in the competition the winners were dressed as um bard and the bar and the barbarian from dungeons and dragons that's brilliant and i asked i went up and asked the, the guy who dressed as the bard I was like, can you morph your face like in the film <laughs> um hilarious but yeah i am literally gonna edit this vlog now i'm gonna have a lot of fomo and probably even get even more depressed so woohoo but it's fine it's 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 okay i hope you've had a good day if not that's okay always remember tomorrow's a new day see you later guys download download <laughs> bye
I was planning to do this reveal. <laughs> Thank you. I used some of my birthday money towards it. <laughs> This is a behind the scenes look at Lucifer. <laughs> so I think this too. I've had the worst day. This has made me so happy. Thank you. You. <laughs> and that's actually the I end of the vlog. Edit.